Welcome to the Healthy Lifestyles Podcast, located here in Northwest Phoenix, Glendale, and Peoria. My name is Dr. Nick Hunter. I am your host, and I am a doctor of physical therapy, and I own and operate Preferred Physical Therapy, where we have helped hundreds of people aged 40 plus stay active and independent, live free from painkillers, and avoid surgery, even if they've had pain for years. This podcast is intended to help you make better decisions about your health so you can find joy in the journey by bringing together top healthcare providers, fitness experts, and nutritionists in the area to give you knowledge and confidence needed to make good health decisions. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the Healthy Lifestyles Podcast, located here in Northwest Phoenix, Glendale, and Peoria. My name is Dr. Nick Hunter. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, and I own and operate Preferred Physical Therapy, where we have helped hundreds of people aged 40 plus stay active and independent, live free from painkillers, and avoid surgery, even if they've had pain for years. I've written over eight ebooks on how to treat common injuries and hosted numerous webinars, all in an effort to help educate the public on how to care for and maintain their bodies to live with joy, dignity, and without compromise. This podcast is intended to help you make better decisions about your health so you can find joy in the journey by bringing together top healthcare providers, fitness experts, and nutritionists in the area to give you the knowledge and confidence needed to make good health decisions. Thank you for joining us today. And today we have Dr. Jeff McAllister. Dr. McAllister is a podiatrist, board-certified foot and ankle surgeon who specializes in advanced foot and ankle reconstruction with offices in Scottsdale and Phoenix. Dr. McAllister's passion for patient care began at the University of Iowa, where he earned his Bachelor's of Science in 2004 before gardening an interest in podiatric medicine and surgery during his time at Temple University School of Podiatric Medicine. Dr. McAllister completed rigorous residency training in the Northern Virginia suburbs through the Innova Fairfax Hospital Podiatric Residency Program, where he received specialized training in foot and ankle trauma, adult and pediatric reconstruction, and diabetic limb salvage. Dr. McAllister even served as the chief resident for the limb salvage service at Georgetown University Hospital during that time. He is honored to be one of the only few podiatric surgeons in the United States that have completed a 12 month surgical fellowship at the prestigious Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Center in Columbus, Ohio. This is a unique fellowship that trains both podiatric and orthopedic surgeons. This advanced surgical training focused on foot and ankle trauma, reconstruction, as well as total ankle replacement. That's gonna be a large topic of our conversation today. This is the same type of fellowship that MDs and DO orthopedic surgeons complete if they wish to subspecialize in foot and ankle. As a fellow member of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons and national speaker and peer educator, Dr. McAllister is passionate about technological advances in the foot and ankle field, specifically in educating patients on the advantages of primary and revision total ankle arthroplasty. Well, Dr. McAllister, is there anything that you want to add to that intro? Oh, that was a great intro. Thank you, Nick. I I think that the, um, so yeah, I've been in, in Phoenix for uh, about eight years now, um, and I what I really want to let the uh, listeners and viewers know is that you know I, I came from a, a big box orthopedic mentality, and where I'm at now is we're we're striving to much like yourself, striving to educate patients and um, consumers of knowledge on uh, foot and ankle topics, and more specifically ankle arthroplasty, and that's what I've really built my private practice around is focusing on the 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 few and far between, which is the patients that have been living with ankle arthritis or ankle pain and stiffness for a very long time and are trying to get rid of it. And so, uh, of course, on the periphery is the heel pain and the ankle sprains and every, everything else that we deal with uh, yeah. and take care of, um, deal with is a bad word, but um, we, we really focus on ankle arthritis and, and bunions, I guess, is the, the smaller nine font, not the 14 font but the nine font um, language is uh, Hallux Valgus or Bunions, which is a whole separate podcast. So yeah, let's dive right into it. And uh, let's, let's get educated on what ankle arthritis means. And it's it's definitely my passion. Definitely. So what was it about ankle arthritis and even total replacement for the ankle joint that you felt like, man, this is, this is thrilling for me. I love it. What is it? Is it, was it a patient that maybe you were treated treating at one time that felt incomplete with what they were able to accomplish 
even where they were and you felt like this was another route? What was there a trigger? What was there in your experience that led, you know what? I, I love this. I love the relief and, and what I'm able to do with these patients. What so happened? I, I think really it started from um, in, in residency. Uh, we, we really only did fusions. And so I saw it as an opportunity or a niche or niche to uh, allow patients motion. And it was, a, yeah. it was the biggest and big toe replacements don't really work that well. It's the only thing that I can do within my, within my subspecialty, the only joint that I can replace um, that works and it, it's a good surgery. So during residency, we didn't do a ton it, it, and I can go through the history and the, the PowerPoint presentation basically, but the, in the early days, quote unquote, it just wasn't as popular and I wanted to be good at something that no one else was. So we all, we always try to fit in and fit our molds, but also we have to create a niche and a spot where we excel. And I, I wanted to do something different. So I felt like this was an opportunity that I latched onto. So, so I started reading about it like anything else. I started learning about it, starting to get into as many of those cases as possible. And I found them fun. I found the cases rewarding during residency. I said, look, these patients actually do pretty darn well. A bunion sweat, you know how a bunions do and, and, and other types of foot surgeries. They just take a long mm -hmm. time to recover. But this is one surgery that was as close to a knee replacement as I could get. And patients were walking in two weeks, recovering well. Yeah. And so uh, that got me like really interested and in make it a, a large impact in people's lives. I'm not making someone that's a couch potato into a marathon or I'm not doing that, but I'm, I'm relieving a large majority of their pain and became a believer over time. So I found a fellowship that like hyper-focused on it. Um, and with, with research, with industry, with, with patient care and volume. So since they did a lot of them, um, then I got to learn a lot. And, and so my, my experience and exposure to them were, you know, multiple fold. So I learned the tricks in the trade, the, the do's and don'ts, the, um, the nuances of really focusing on perfection, basically, and trying to get that perfect sign or not perfect science, a perfect science. And they were doing a lot of the research at that second largest foot and ankle center in the country. There's another big one, Ortho Carolina in North Carolina. But this one is just a huge mecca for total ankles for whatever reason. So um, that then I really dug in, dug my teeth in and took a big bite off. And, and I, I've loved it ever since. Uh, so now I just I, I focus on it and and it gives people a, a big smile on their face. Usually. I mean, that's yeah. And you brought that to the North Phoenix area. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's So tell me a little bit. What, what was the patient population that you were wanting to serve uniquely by being able to perform this total replacement, this total ankle replacement, because oh, you mentioned fusions. Now, previously folks who have really painful, stiff ankles from, and we'll go into kind of the, the medical yeah. history that these yeah. people typically endure. I mean, not that it's going to be a, a, a perfect timeline of all the events that led to this moment in their ankle condition, but sure. fusion was the only option and the preferred option because it was so routine and common for surgeons to do that, that um, but also had a lot of drawbacks to it in, in the stiffness, right. the limited mobility, yep. I mean, the people who wanted to go hiking, even just walk to the mailbox, it was, it made it quite tough. And so they were faced with either amputation or fusion. Right. Fusion was the better alternative, but now we have the opportunity for this ankle replacement because it, it does offer a lot more, as you mentioned, mobility, so you can move it more normally and bear the load necessary to enjoy a, a hike or a Sunday afternoon walk or even a regular walking program. Yes. And people are able to stay healthy. So what is it about their medical history or their stories that you typically will see in your office that then helps you say, okay, this is gonna be a good candidate for this procedure? Yeah, so to answer your question, the, the first thing I do when I walk in the room typically um, is I ask them what their most aggressive activity is, whether it's the 41 year old that I saw today or the 85 year old that I saw on Monday. So what is the most aggressive activity that you do? And to me, that, that gets me like, I, I get to know their day, like in one sentence, I get to know their week in one sentence. Like what, what is the big thing that you do? I enjoy hiking Piesta peak. Okay, great. Well, maybe you're not a candidate. You know, I, I get to know very quickly, like answer yes or no, black and white. Is this person going to 
do well with an ankle? Are, are they going to, is the ankle going to be able to do well with them? Is their activity level so high that they won't even need anything because they're pretty high functioning with an AFO or brace, ankle yeah. foot orthosis, um, or are they mentally ready for it? So if they're a pickleball active Northwest Phoenix, I would say type of patient, Sun City, Wester, then, then um, they, if they're pl playing three days of pickleball a week and they don't want to give it up, they're probably not ready. If they're a hiker, walker, golfer, swimmer, great, let's do it. So they've done a survey of over a thousand total ankles in one study. They just highlighted the big ticket. Um, they asked everybody what their big ticket activities were. So this big survey and the top three things kind of works out for Phoenix or worked out for Phoenix. So as I kind of made my way through the trudge and the, the snow and across the Mississippi over to the, to the valley, I found that this was a kind of prime opportunity, much like a hip or knee guy would kind of follow the trends. Um, this, this patient population does just that. A golf, hike, swim, walk, those type of low load activities, the same exact activities that you would expect out of a total knee. So, yeah. um, and uh, the, the, so that's the center of the bell curve. And then there are the extremes, obviously, the 85 active, uh, physiologically not 85 active person that does somehow does CrossFit um, or the 41 year old that uh, struggles because they had a pilon fracture, a bad ankle fracture, and they're really struggling with the reality of a traumatic event. So, <clears throat> so excellent, excellent description for that. And have you noticed, I, I know you said that there's the two ends of that spectrum, the 41 and the 83 year old individual, most of your people are that maybe late 50 to mid 65 i would say my yeah to answer your question actually the to the i i what i see is probably the not straight up softball rheumatoid you know 67 year old lady that plays backgammon I, i'm seeing the guy that sprained his he played basketball he's 47 he played basketball at eastern kentucky state making this up as we go here yeah. he, but i've had multiple patients with similar stories uh multiple ankle sprains um perineal tendons are gone, their ankles collapsed, they're sitting in Varus, and now we have to figure out how to get their, their ankles crooked. They're walking on yeah. a crooked ankle. We have to get them upright again and, uh, and with some function. Now, there's the extremes that just can't be, it can't be undone, but right. my goal is to make a dysfunctional ankle functional and get their foot underneath them. And the, the goal ultimately is pain relief, obviously, and then, and then that, that mobility afterwards. Perfect. And what are kind of the struggles that you see a lot of these patients that will come in and say, okay, but I've had my last straw. I need, I need something more aggressive. I need this procedure because they've, they've like, they failed the orthotics. They failed conservative care with either physical therapy or they just can't do the exercises. What is it that these people are struggling with that now there's some like enough is enough and I need to do this. Um, do you mean uh, like, what is their, like, what are they complaining of pain wise at that point? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, most by, by location or intensity. Yeah. Cause I want, I want our listeners to be able to say, you know what, this sounds a lot like some of the things I've got going on or I've been, yeah. I've been in a similar situation. Yeah. So, I mean, most patients that come in, bring their, their either bags of bag of braces or yeah. orthotics, they have multiple shoes on with them. They've they tried every shoe. They've tried every shoe. The Hoka, the, they tried the Topo, they tried everything. Yeah, the rocker bottom thing, that intense pain, basically arthritis, just like a knee or hip feels, um, I, I think, feels um, stiff in the morning. It, it loosens up throughout the day. It aches if you sit down and rest for half an hour and try to get back up, becomes stiff again and hurts a lot at the end of the day. They're sharp, specifically with the ankle. The ankle, I want the listeners to understand how the ankle functions. So the ankle functions almost like a hinge up and down. So basically, if you put your foot flat on the ground, if you're listening to us here, and you try to drive your knee over your toes, the goal typically is to get your knee over your toes. And I just do a quick little thing in the office to see how much motion they have. So I'll have them do like a quick little lunge there. And that gives me an idea of how much impingement or bony, bony, um, uh, contracture and osteophytes and stuff they have in the front of the ankle right so uh patients are going to feel a, a stiffness they're not able to get their their knee over their midfoot or at anything at all uh so lack of mobility and just sharp stabbing pain 
Um, and, uh, and, and usually if, if the patient walks like with the foot slightly tilted out, right. So that hip mm -hmm. externally rotates, as you know, Nick, the, you're not able to, uh, fully bend through the ankle anymore. So that uphill motion is tough going up hills. You really struggle upstairs. You're doing the two, two footed thing and, um, your hip externally rotates. So your foot goes sideways. Um, and then uh, during that rehab course and after everything is done, we try to focus really on getting back to a more normal symmetric gait. Perfect. <clears throat> now, why is it you think that this is not, um, for, we mentioned knee replacement several times already. Why is it you feel like this is a, a bit more unknown or more yeah. more rare procedure or, or yeah. even option because right. we can talk about non-surgical forms of treatment whether it's the prp or yep. even uh, stem cell injections to to the joint all things to try and rehabilitate the, the joint surface to get it to grow back as best as we can and we know that right. those have limited success to a point where now we need to have this more aggressive option and without it being a fusion this this replacement procedure exists and, and it, it just doesn't happen very often. I think it, it so the ankle, first of all, foot and ankle in general, um, it, it follows, it's like the little brother, basically. I, I think of it like a little brother. It, it follows the trends of every other kind of joint. It fought in the literature, in the industry, in, in data, in everything that we do kind of follows how we, we watch and wait we're the smarter younger brother. We watch and wait to see how the older brother does with their knee replacements and their hip replacements and their anchors and all this stuff. We take the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we say, okay, it, it may work down here. Let's try it out for a little while. And total ankles specifically has seen kind of like a life cycle. So just a real quick thing, basically Europe, there's like 40 different versions. There's, uh, they've been around since the seventies or so. And FDA, big brother, has really only allowed a couple in. So the sieve of, of uh, regulatory affairs have only allowed a couple into the U.S. very slowly. And that started right around 75-ish, 80. And, and then the real, the real bulk of this is the education or the understanding of the anatomy of the ankle, which really is baffling to any listener, really. It's like, how would you not know your own anatomy? Well, I think from a scientific standpoint and a biomechanical standpoint and a physical therapy standpoint, we're still kind of in this life cycle of understanding how the ankle functions really well. And we're like peaking at, hey, we're, we got this. And, and that's where we're starting to see those ankle replacements last a long time. Meaning in the beginning, they did not last long and they got basically like shut down. It was just like an mm. experimental fusion. That's it. Gold standard. Stop doing the ankle replacements. They're not working because you're not we put shoulder replacements in the ankle. It just wasn't natural anatomy. So as we started to biomechanically and technologically understand the ankle just a little bit more and how it kind of inverts and everts at the same time as dorsiflexion of supinates and the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, we understood or an understanding how the, the anatomy works. So then we know how to replace the anatomy and make it more functional. So every implant has gotten better and better and so everybody, meaning uh, patients, patients listening, maybe with a mild ankle pain, or maybe that broke their ankle when they were 20 years old and just kind of have been struggling with it for a long time, which is very common, or the primary care doc, or the nurse practitioner, or the DPT listening to this, they just thought the goal, that the gold standard was ankle fusion. That's because the you haven't been educated, you don't know about it, you don't, you haven't heard about it, which is why we're talking. But I think the the problem is that the the science hasn't been there and it just it's almost like a rumor mill like telephone game and it just for a long time it has just been like eh, it does, they don't work it's not good surgery yeah. and so um and i could i could spit studies for a, a long time uh with you but i think generally speaking that's not true anymore the survivorship of these things at at 10 years for most of them most of the ones that have been around for a while is around 93 percent I mean, that's, that's awesome. pretty good. I mean, yeah, we look at knees as like 10 to 15, 20 is a push in it for a knee replacement. Right, right. Uh, you probably can if you got it later on in life and you're not having been active. Yes, right. Uh, and so you're saying that ankle replacements, those prosthetic can be 10 years, yes. 93%. That's fantastic. Definitely. Yeah. So do you um, think that maybe some of that hindrance is the fact that some of these better replacements, some of these better technologies haven't been out as long just yet to then have a 
backload of studies to say, hey, we're, we're out here. These are doing great. Look at this. We, we're, the timeline hasn't advanced long enough yet. Is that part of the problem you speculate? 100%. 99.9% 9 of the problem. The other 0.1 is volume. So there are way more hips and knees. Therefore, there's more data. There's more. There's it's just, you know, it builds up. Totally, so totally. The, the more data behind it, the more are the more done, the more data, the more the bigger success rate, the, the better the industry gets with anything. So that's kind of where where it's it's headed. And so for perspective, I think it's 700, 800,000 a year knees in that category. Yeah, and then and there's, and there's like 10, right around 10,000 a year ankles. OK, so it takes a lot longer for for that process to happen. But it's it's definitely getting there. And then people are just getting better trained um, and, and learning how to do them better and faster and more efficiently and doing them in surgery centers and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just here to, um, you know, really tell, tell the listeners and crowd that, you know, it works if you're the right candidate without infection and these other kind of outliers that we can talk about that really just says, mm, you're probably not the right, right patient for it. But um, I definitely think it's definitely worth talking about and at least ruling out um, and having a good conversation with someone that does them all the time. Yeah. Do you see some of these candidates being, um, or having a background in a, in a traumatic incident, whether that's through a fall or motor vehicle accident, motorcycle, yeah. whatever the case might be either early on or even recently that now it's like, we can try and put this thing back together or we can do the replacement we, because we see um, that sometimes with hips. Do yeah, you see that yeah. with, with ankle as well? Um, two, twofold question. So one is the most common type of ankle arthritis post-traumatic. Yes. So to me, trauma knows no age. I've seen multiple younger patients in the 40, early 40 range, even late thirties that broke their ankle when they were, I don't know, 10, whatever it was and plate screws, the whole nine yards. And that's physiologically the same exact thing that would happen in a 50 year old. So now not every 25 year old needs an ankle replacement, obviously. But that kind of incident and event happens in younger patients. Okay, so post-traumatic arthritis is the most common type of arthritis. The, the other part of the question is, um, um, shoot, you asked me about, oh, so in, in, in hips trauma. and knees, yeah, in shoulders more specifically, like uh -huh. if, if someone breaks their proximal humeral head or their humeral head, it's a, sometimes it's a reverse, like, like that. Now, I wish it was that way. And it's not though, the technology is just not there to support it yet. Uh, you've seen x-rays with like the long stems going kind of up or down the, the humeral shaft and down the femur and stuff. So not hip fractures are more um, morbid. So you can't die from an ankle fracture. You definitely have a higher blood loss potential and all that stuff with the hip replacement. So um, no, it's unfortunately with ankles right now, it's, you know, break breaks, you fix it. You write it out. You see someone later about it, and that sure. later that later word is two to ten years later. So it just kind of okay. depends, you know. But definitely, a post traumatic history 100%. or incident is very very common for that development common, or, yeah. or acceleration of arthritis. And we see it with, with all kinds of joints, really. But so those of us who have jumped off the top of our roof thinking that the pillowcase right. or the garbage bag is going to parachute us down, or, or the or the pool. Yeah, those things do come back to bite us in the butt a bit. What about from your perspective, Nick, about PT? Like, what's the most recent patient that you've seen with an ankle replacement? And like, what kind of struggles have you seen with it? I've only seen one in my career. And uh, I thought it was, a, was fantastic. Uh, I mean, from a standpoint, similar to knee replacement, in the sense that, uh, you know, physiologically speaking, the, the anatomy is in a good, stable position, that everything is set we just get to work on the fun stuff and that's the motion and strength and, right. and then return to function. So I, I really enjoy it. Same kind of thing with, we have people who come in with complex fractures and they've got pins and rods and, mm -hmm. and we're, we're working through a similar series of working on some uh, very easy swelling range of motion type exercises and activities to help minimize yep. any stiffness that's going to be inherent to that area. And, and then we get to get, we get going right away. I, I love how, how liberating it is a bit um right you know from the same point we've i've only seen one awesome. it is one of those where I, I i wish um i wish there was more known about it i wish some candidates might be a bit more open to it but i think you've hit on all the points as to why so many patients may be um 
uh, ruled out, maybe not not the right candidate yet, but I, I think it's going to be interesting as we go forward. The, the I've got one individual who uh, was in a work-related accident. Mm -hmm. This is 10, 11 years now, had a, a, a complex fracture through his entire um, lower ankle. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was fused. A lot of it was, was put in place. Not a true fusion, but as a yeah. result has been fused and I think right. he's going to be a great candidate for replacement. Yes. I nice. kind of wish he would, he would do it sooner. He's got all kinds of concerns about it because of how much surgical adaptation intervention right. he's already had and didn't have right. a great response to it. Um, gotcha. But from a standpoint of where I think he's going to be going, I think it would be a, a really good candidate for, nice. for nice. that because it is one of those where um, you do see kind of an improvement of, of, of motion, a, a liberation to the joint in the sense where, there isn't as much stiffness. There is a bit, a bit more freedom of movement just in, in cleaning out that arthritic joint that isn't responding well to movement or load. Right. And now the muscles are able to strengthen uh, as similarly as they would before, but the joint is just healthier yeah. and, and they're happier with it. The, the nice thing with it is that um, it preserves the, the potentially, and studies have shown that it, a couple of things. One, it has pres it preserves some Taylor joint range of motion. So that hind foot range of motion, the, the uneven surfaces that a lot of uh, Phoenicians experience on their rocky backyards. Um, it, it since we're replace since we're replacing and maintaining uh, motion in the ankle joint, we're not uh, provoking any decrease in range of motion in the subtalar joint. So it's just I think of it like the spine. We're just kind of we're we're trying to save joints here, and so yeah. that's the idea with with and sometimes people use the subtalar joint as kind of a guide. So if there's any like early arthritic changes, then it says, okay, let's, let's, let's go. It's go time. We need an ankle because uh, a fusion will cause an increase in subtalar joint arthritis very quickly. hundred percent. Yeah. And we see that with any kind of fusion, the right. joints above and below it then yep. suffer. And the spine is the, one of the most commonly fused segments of, of joint. And because there are multiple segments right near where the fusion, we see it time and time again. I mean, there, there's now a condition of a, of a, post-surgical or post-fusion pain syndrome for mm -hmm. people who have had these because it is now we're wearing out the joint above and below it. And even if you have the lowest lumbar vertebrae fused, yeah. it's the next one up and the hip that then suffer. It, it just transfers oh. across the pelvis. Right. And so you're right on. And, and I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because the preservation of adjoining joints is a, a really a heavy consideration that is vastly overlooked just because of the simplicity of the fusion when right. really it may not be in the best interest of the patient, yeah. uh, but it is in the best interest of the surgeon who may not be as qualified to do the procedure that's necessary. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. part of that's maybe access because as, as mentioned, even in your intro, there's not a lot of surgeons that are qualified, trained enough, confident enough in, in that ability to, to do that. And it is, it is complex and, and joint replacement is, is one of those that you don't really want to mess with if you're, right. if you're not trained. Right. Thanks, man. Um, Great. We do well, have a, a few uh, more great. minutes. I, I got a question for you because yeah, it is one of the things I, I love talking about foot and ankle, especially with people like yourself, because I think it's so overlooked when we go up the chain to, to knee problems, to hip problems, to spine problems, even to neck problems. What is it about the foot and ankle that you feel is so overlooked that you wish you could tell more of your patients to take care of or to watch out for, or to, or to be cognizant of? Um, I think the, the, the hardest thing to almost the hardest thing to teach people how to do, but the most important is, um, proprioception. I, I, I can't, yeah, so it's balance of awareness and space. Yes. I mean, more than balance, but right. And it's the perineals, the perineals are this, this, there's two tendons on the side of the ankle. Okay. They are the, the ankle is like a puppet. The ankle has tendons on, it's like a marionette, has tendons or strings on one side and strings on the other. And so these strings, listeners, have, have become, they're just underrated. Uh, we focus on flat feet a lot. We focus on tendons that kind of help control your arch because everybody cares about the arch. But it's, you can live with a flat foot for a long time but you cannot live with a high arched, unstable ankle for very long. I mean, live is a relative word, but it, with, with pain. And as, as these tendons on the outside of your ankle become weak and dysfunctional, your ankle starts to roll. Your ankle, you have pain on your, the outside of your foot. 
It feels like a stress fracture. It, it hurts when you walk a lot. And so when they come in in these subtle cavus foot type of cases or subtle high arch type of cases, we have perineal weakness, which is very hard to like touch. It's very hard to, um, to test re really, really well. And yeah. sometimes and it looks like show up syndrome. on an MRI. Huh? It'll look like cuboid syndrome or something else. Yeah. yeah. And, and just our like just literal fifth met base pain. And, and that could literally be just perineus brevis weakness with a little bit of like uh, corrective orthotic and a little bit of perineal strengthening. So the, 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 the answer to the question is strengthen the perineal tendons and uh, work on balance, which is a yoga Tai Chi probably if I had to kind of throw something out there. Tai Chi but, is famously studied for this. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's something that I get like flat feet people can live with for a long plantar fasciitis comes and goes usually. Um, but if I had to say one thing that to keep yourself out of my office, it would be to, to work on those things. I love it because it's one thing I think a lot of foot and ankle conditions are overlooked. Like you mentioned, Achilles tendon gets a lot of attention, heel pain, yeah. plantar fasciitis, a lot of attention, yep. the flat foot. So we do a lot of posterior tib work, which helps sure. muscularly support the arch, but the peroneals, these are the ones on the outside of the ankle, the ones that are primarily responsible for helping stop an, 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 uh, your typical ankle yep. sprain, inversion ankle sprain. They do wear down, especially when we're, we're no longer as active and we keep all of our activities forward or backwards. These are muscles that participate in some of that, but not to the degree that's necessary right. to keep them healthy and strong and your foot stable. And so balance exercise, it's a standard, it's a, it, an absolute must with any foot and ankle injury that we do. You're going to do balance exercises at some point in your progression uh, because it is so hugely important and everyone declines over the age of 55 in our balance. So we, we must do balance for other people. So everybody needs a wobble board. We need to get everybody a wobble board love it. or some kind of BOSU ball thing. Just put our name on right. it and um, prefer PT wobble board thing. And it's, it's for nine 99 uh, for sale on Nick's website. <laughs> uh, I'll send you my affiliate link. <laughs> yeah, there's a small, medium and large. I love it. No, I, I, we tell patients all the time, hey, if worst case scenario, throw a pillow on the ground and stand on your pillow, throw yeah, a yeah. couch cushion on the ground, stand, right. stand on something that's not going to be easy oh. to stand on. Once you've graduated from, if you can't just stand on flat ground, barefoot, right. without pain, and be able to stand there, eyes open for 30 seconds, that's your litmus test. Can you do that first? And then let's make it a little bit more challenging because it is yeah. it is absolutely one of those that everyone needs to be attending to because that does lead to a whole lot more foot breakdown, foot strength breakdown, intrinsic foot breakdown, and then on up the chain it goes. So I'm, I think it's yep. great that you brought that up. I was... I can still remember the first time I saw a peroneal tendon repair and I thought, how in the oh. world does these things tear? And it was yeah. a spontaneous tear. It was one of those that just degraded over time. And then you right. had just an, enough load to snap it. And I thought, I yeah. did not know that this surgery existed, this, but yeah. it, it absolutely happens. And now I've seen them, I've seen them so often. And I'm like, how yeah. in the world did we not take it's, care of this? Yep. It's, it's uh, often picked up on MRIs and asymptomatic or it's, it's overlooked and all of a sudden they're walking on this, you know, they have repeat fifth met stress fractures. They, you know, have a cabus foot that, you know, they sprain their ankle every couple of days. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the extreme, but it's the, it's the uh, tweeners and the subtle, the subtle cabus, the subtle high arch feet that really struggle to find something. And um, then it's a shoe talk and orthotic talk and, all that kind of stuff. And you, you do that. I assume Nick, you talk to them about stuff like that and get them functional again and everything, which is your totally. foundation, right? All the easy things first. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know you got to go. So in closing, what, what is one thing that you wish you could just put on repeat? Something that you tell your patients so often you could say it once, have it on repeat. What would it be that you think is, is uh, so important that you want your patients, people to know in order to take care of their foot um, I think if, uh, besides the proprioception thing, I think if I had to um, kind of, uh, the, you know, dumb it down basically to one like easy thing for, for patients to be cognizant of really is um, seek early treatment. I mean, I, I think that seeking early uh, treatment gets you knowledgeable, seeking knowledge, listening to podcasts like this, uh, listening to uh, reading as much as possible, uh, preferably not on social media, but reading as much as possible on the internet about your condition and don't let it go too long because there are some cases where 
you know, that we, we come in after an ankle fracture and we take an x-ray that you haven't taken in 10, 15 years, and it, it might be too far gone that we can do anything. So just seek early treatment, get evaluated. Don't put your head in the sand. It's kind of the easy way to say it. And um, self-care. So we hear it all the time. I wish I would have done something sooner. Yeah. I hear it all the time. I'm sure you yeah. hear that in your office too. Yeah. It absolutely is true. And you heard it here first. Here's a doc who's suggesting and supporting going to the internet and looking for solutions, looking for answers, getting informed. I, I completely agree with you. I love how much transparency there is now in medicine, how much access people have to either reviews, uh, to, to documents, to literature. I mean, it's just, it's so accessible. And yeah, it might be above a lot of people's head, but it, it does raise a lot of questions or at least give you some some fuel for, hey, here's my visit. I got these concerns. This is what I read. This is what I learned. Help help solve this for me so I can make the next best decision. I, I think it's fantastic. And I'm, I'm all for it. Just as long as it, we, they do give, you know, we do give our opinion or suggestion and they, they're willing to then move forward with that recommendation. Yeah. Of course. Well, awesome. Thanks, all right. Hey, awesome. that will conclude the, uh, the interview. Thanks so much for your time. I wish we had more. There's so much I want to go into it. We could definitely know, do it again. There's a lot. There's a lot. Preferred Physical Therapy and the guests on this show does not recommend, endorse, or make any representation about the efficacy, appropriateness, or suitability of any specific tests, products, procedures, treatments, services, opinions, healthcare providers, or other information that may be contained on or available through this content. Preferred Physical Therapy and the guests on this show are not responsible nor liable for any advice, course of treatment, diagnosis, or any other information, services, or products that you obtained through this audio recording. For specific information regarding your case, please consult a licensed professional in your area.